today. Everybody ready for our patented chill point chill in? This is chill point. Paul, yeah. how are you chilling in? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling in pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Too bad the locks on the backs of these chairs don't work so good. <laughs> yeah, you started to do that. My brain was like, oh, he's going to fall off not, on camera, I'm, but at least it's on camera, I guess. I'm not authorizing new chairs. <laughs> no, that's fine. It sounds like he just needs to chill out. Uh, but yes, uh, it, it is... Abnormally warm around here, so I'm happy ah, that we're we're chilling in this uh, air conditioned room. Yeah, isn't it great? It's warm out. Yeah. It's September already. Stop it. Was it the most? Is it the the highest on record? I, th- yesterday, I saw that somewhere. Yeah. Yesterday was the highest September or something day. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just, it's just it's just the phrase is real good. Yesterday was the highest September day. Yeah. <laughs> The highest September day. Yeah, everyone got very high. It's uh, it says it's my watch tells me it's twenty six degrees out right now, mm-hmm. and I mean, uh, in in the surrounding area, it probably is about. It was very warm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of warm out. It measures this at the airport, so I can have. I'm assuming the airport. Don't go to the airport. It's twenty six no. degrees there. On the tarmac, yeah. Yeah. Also, I guess your watch is there for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> if, you see, if you go to the I, airport, if you see Beach's watch, please let us know. I know that, like, I have, or, okay, I have heard rumors that in Victoria, we have multiple weather stations that were generally uh, focused at multiple high schools. There was a system that did that, yes. Yeah, for a while. And, uh, and that I thought that meant that they were being made available to um, the Canada uh, Meteorological Meteorological Agency, or mm. whatever it is that we mm. use to track that Weather Canada. I'm not really sure what we call that group again, but but then I thought that also meant that because all that information ends up coming into like Apple Weather or something, I'd be able to pick, you know, Victoria, my neighborhood specifically, there, like Oak yeah. Bay or James Bay or whatever. That was a program that was running at one point. It wasn't like. There was like a specific website you could go to that had that all that information. Yeah, well, but I believe that program has see, since been mm-hmm. discontinued. I heard there were used to be rumors that there were all kinds of underground tunnels in Victoria that could take you all the way to Vancouver. <laughs> really? No. That sounds amazing, though. I, <laughs> I can see a couple of big problems with the tunnel to Vancouver. I was really into that idea. Like, I know, right? I, I. You'd have to go down quite far. Yeah. Yeah. And then come up again quite But far. you know what? It'd probably be really cold down there. I do love the, I mean, there's always that, that, you know, sort of slightly old man yelling at clouds aspect of, not that I don't do this myself, right. but uh, of like, what, you know, what's the weather? What's the temperature? Here, let me get out my phone. My phone will then contact a satellite yes. in space and coordinate with three other satellites to find out where my location is. Use that to contact, uh, you know, a central weather authority that will then uh, use uploaded information from various places around the uh, area to calculate what the weather is. Yeah. So that I don't have to look outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like the amount of technology required to do that as opposed to like have a thermometer like by the wall. I feel like Oh goodness. I it's weird cuz I'm like oh, I'm I don't flashing back to some stuff. I don't think it's an old person thing to have a thermometer hanging outside of a window. Yes it is. But I think that it's a thing that you only end up doing when you're an old person. Like mm-hmm. it's like it's it's like even when I was 18 or 19 years old, it would have been nice to know what the temperature was like outside. But I had more important things to spend you my money on than an indoor don't outdoor thermometer. Count. You came out an old man. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that was apparently Chill Point Chill Talk, mm-hmm. where we talked <laughs> about uh, weather grumpiness. Hey, everybody. Uh, what this show is supposed to be is talking about video game stuff and talking about the episode of Checkpoint that went up yesterday, uh, hosted by Bij and Kathleen. Very entertaining episode. Lots of silly stuff going on. Um, so let's 
let's get into it and uh, talk about some of the stuff that happened <laughs> once <laughs> Once I you sign back in, get signed from back being in. Just in there, because Google's decided that I am no longer myself. Every Friday, it's every like, every, every Friday. Friday, every Friday. It's, Why uh, is Paul really Paul? Let's find out. Mm-hmm. They're hoping that someone is going to like, uh, at, at some point, someone's going to steal your password online. I guess you're just going to end up typing it into the wrong window or something during a stream. Um, so, starting with. Uh, Some sour grapes. Yeah, Concord. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> okay. Not not the uh, not the airplanes. Um, although you know those have also been discontinued. Yeah, but they, lasted, they, they lasted longer. significantly longer. Yeah. Uh, the Concord, the game lasted uh, only a little bit longer than you know a Concord flight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mean Flight of the Concords? Exactly. I thought they were still around. That's with the CH. It's different, different deal. Oh, oh okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is, you know, I'm sure there will be, I, I hope that there will be some sort of post-mortem thing that comes out about this, that somebody yeah. gets the real story about. The oral history of Concord? Yeah, so. where, when, and, and you guys talked about this. After the in the after show, I yeah. don't know if it made it into the episode, but yeah, it did. Um, talking about the like, at what point in the development process did they know it was doomed? Yeah, and did, <laughs> and did not just maybe the top brass of of the studio, but everybody in the company knew. Because uh, Heather did ask me last night. Uh, she said, "What would be worse?" Oh yeah, mm. what would be worse? Uh, knowing that the thing that you're working on is dead on arrival the day it goes out. Or finding out at the same time everyone else is that they're pulling the game. Like through the news. See, and what's a little, what's slightly unique about, I feel like, about Concord's fall from uh, whatever. I mean, it's not even fall from grace because it didn't start out any good. But no, yeah. Is that, is that unlike, you know, like say Redfall had, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of issues with it. Stuff. So, from everything I've read, I haven't played it, and I can no longer play it because it has been taken off old stores. All right. But all the stuff I've read says that it was a solid game. Oh, good. Like, it didn't yeah. have huge... It wasn't like it was a buggy mess. It, there was nothing inherently... Prob, there wasn't any inherent problems with the game itself. Maybe it was not, like, innovative. But from a technical point of view, the gameplay was fun. It was, it was a cool thing. It just so the problems were not was not the game itself. It was you know it didn't get the uptake. It didn't get the support. It didn't get um, you know the combination of it didn't get the support from Sony and so possibly you know or you know it didn't have a style or a uh, you know it, it didn't resonate with people. Didn't get the uptake from Sony. Didn't right. get the players, and so I I mean I'll agree. Like it's hard. You can't disagree with the hard numbers of. They didn't have a lot of concurrent players. They didn't have a lot going on. Uh, I will say, watching you and Kathleen talk about having never heard of this game, and I understand why, was very painful for me. Yeah. Because I saw the state of play when it showed up. <laughs> I told you about the state of play that it showed up in. Because for a moment, I was interested in that game. Yeah. When it was the cinematic, and I was like, "Oh, that could be fun," and then they showed what kind of game it was. There's a six v six hero. I definitely yeah. heard like, it, it's that same thing of the like, you know, you go through the whole, go through the whole thing, and then, you know, you you find out that, uh, the game is being, you know, developed by. You're like, oh, it's yeah. Been- I kind of like that feeling. It's just like they had a really nice cinematic that seemed jokey and fun. Like these might be yeah. characters that could be interesting. And yeah, it felt very Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't think of that as a it's not a bad as thing. a bad thing. It's a thing that kind of keeps getting thrown around as a bad thing, which I find a little weird. But okay, sure. Um, and they were like, "Yeah, wasn't that cinematic really cool? Let's show you some gameplay." And I was like, "Oh, it's a genre of games I don't like." Yeah. Well, yeah. dang. It's just like. And, I, hmm. I All mean, right. as someone who is a primarily single-player gamer, uh, 
that is the like that is an oft, often an experience that I have watching any of these events mm-hmm. is that you know it's the constant like oh this looks cool oh it's not for me this yeah. looks oh it's not for me and the other this one, thing oh it's not for me I yeah. want to point out is that Concord is uh, supposed to have an episode in the Secret Level yes. series and it's still going to yeah well apparently. I mean, it's, presumably it's like done. Because yeah. it's just like it's a CG. It's like um, death, love, death, and robots. Like it's yeah. like an animated thing. So it's being done by like somebody completely. But you know, obviously, they were hoping that it would have a su- the support. That was probably supposed to like of help, like a built in like, fan push base, it, right? Like I just. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a few people say they saw, like, ads for it on Twitch, but they didn't know what the game was or whatever. And mm. sometimes you get ads for games like that. They don't show you gameplay or, like, I never saw those particularly. I keep getting McDonald's ads, which are annoying, but, mm-hmm. like... No gameplay at all. Sometimes you don't get gameplay. Sometimes you get a trailer that looks fun. It's meant to spark interest for you to go check it out. But some people thought it was, like, a new Star Wars game. So I have, a, uh, I have an alternate suggestion as to what happened here. Is that... Um... Concord came out and it did not make a splash. Like it did not do the numbers they wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. And so they said, okay, the, this is in case of emergency break glass. And the plan was behind the, the glass thing is cancel the game immediately, refund all the money to everybody who, who got it. Mm-hmm. When the, when the outcry and the, and the, and the wailing and gnashing of teeth hits the media, we will see what the relative buzz is because everyone will hear about this game that got canceled incredibly fast. Then based on that, a month or two after the buzz is like really kind of built to a fever pitch, we will release the game again um, and we will say, sorry, apparently you all wanted to play it. And then everyone will rush to get in and actually buy the game at that point and we'll sell a million copies and then everything will be wonderful. Your conspiracy theory plan is completely unlikely. Mm-hmm. There's no way someone makes a plan like that. And if that it was their plan for some reason, it's clearly failed. It's, it's the emergency that's, plan that's, that's always not, been in I, Sony's headquarters that they, they never use. And then this no. is the one where they decide to in use fact, it. In fact, given how low their, their, the amount of people playing is, and yeah. uh, there was uh, a lack of push that, that probably could have had more of, there's no way that that was a real plan. I call this the reverse Morbius. Yeah, I was going to say, as Socratic man, yeah, the Morbius, that's not the reverse Morbius. That's well, just Morbius again. Mor- but Mor- Morbius went into the theaters and it did poorly. So they canceled it and then everyone memed about it because they were like, lol, this is hilarious. And they acted like, no, I totally want to see this movie now. So Sony was like, oh, okay. So they, they put the money back in and re released it in the theaters and like, lol, we didn't want to see this movie, you idiots. And nobody went and saw it a second time. Right. Which is so the basically... reverse Morbius is you can't you take something away before people get a chance to know it, and then you give it back to them, and they all like, yes, I got the thing that I couldn't have. No, and is that I think that's just Morbius, but it actually going the way they were hoping it would. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I I have heard I heard like one podcaster I listened to who who was actually really interested in the game and really wanted to play it, uh, and that was about a week ago before they found out that it was. Canceled. So I'm looking forward to the next episode when they well, found out that they're going to get a refund. I mean, when when uh, when Kathleen's talking about the uh, you know the gimmick of Concord was that they were supposed to have these like animated cinematics every week. Yeah, and uh, for like I that you know yesterday morning uh, I got a screenshot of a of a uh you know the r slash concord subreddit Mm -hmm. uh somebody that's like posted three days ago i'm so excited about what they're going to talk about in the next cinematic (laughs) what is it going to be is it going to be about this person who are these people like what's going to happen and there's a bulk of them that are finished already you know that i think there's some really cool ideas there i think uh Having a game that goes out that's forty dollars now, I grant it, I get it. People don't want to just risk forty dollars and not know if they want to play the game, and so a lot of people are like, "Oh, free to play is what we want," and like, but except we all complain about how free to play is awful and it's actually a one hundred dollar battle pass, yeah. And we'd rather just pay the forty bucks and be done with it, and then and then you need a reason for people to come back and like cinematics for every week. That would have been really cool. Yeah. yeah. And there, you know, the $40 thing is that, you know, there's that aspect. It's like, that's what everybody keeps saying they want. So we'll do it. But no. Yeah. Granted, but, the, the, you know, it's not a genre people really want to play right now, apparently, it, or well, there's it, too it, many or games it's just, it's or just, it's, something. It's that thing where it's like, yeah, it's oversaturated and 
the problem I see with a lot of these multiplayer games, especially sort of multi multiplayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is six v six. Yeah. But it's especially the case in like battle royale style ones where it's like hundred players. Right. But even with this, the where you need a, you fundamentally need a uh, certain amount of players in order to make the thing work at all. Sure. Yeah. And so the problem with that though is that there's like there's no long tail. Right. Like the, you can be the first, you can be like the first or the second or the third in the market, and then that's it. Yeah. Like the people keep seeing, you know, Overwatch or they see all these other, they, they see these other really popular multiplayer games and they're like, that's so popular. If we could just capture like 1% of that, yeah, you know, then we could be successful. But it's like, that doesn't work. You I, can't, like there, there, they, there's no, the market doesn't work that way. Yeah. You need be, at least 15 to 20% of the player be, because, base. Because, just to get because there's, there's a, a fundamental like minimum number of people or else the system doesn't work at all. Yeah. And yeah. it just falls apart. You need to jump in and actually make a big splash and have like a hundred thousand people, 50,000 people. Maybe 50,000 people might just be enough to be like, this gets our game rolling enough to get people talking about it. So that you can actually like match make. Yeah. So yeah. that depends on. Uh, the studio, the publisher, how many copies of a game you need selling in order to right. make even like is that's that's the problem, right? Like fifty thousand copies of a game sold for say an indie, that's huge. Fifty thousand copies of a game sold for maybe a triple A something game that's had billions of dollars put into it. And I'm not saying that's what Concord is, but that kind of thing, that's not is a case like this somewhere where free to start is maybe a better idea? That if you're like, I'm trying to win over a market of people to play, where you say to them that here you're gonna here's the game, and you're gonna get um, like you're gonna get four maps for free out of the twelve maps, or you can only play on four maps or three maps or whatever, right? You can only choose from these three heroes at the start of the whole thing. Um, the full game, which you can unlock for forty dollars. Uh, is there if you want to play it but we've given you three different heroes to play as and we've given you three maps to play on and if you want to play more maps and you want to match make into those other areas you can do that and that lets and you can only and here's the worst thing but i'll put this out there too you can only play so many matches per day we'll mm -hmm. give you we'll give you six matches or ten matches whatever they think is enough mm -hmm. to kind of keep people like interested in the coming back but you maybe only get to play for about an hour and a half and then you're like okay, well, I want to play more of this. And then you're so, like, well, my buddies and I want to play for the evening. And you're like, okay, well, I guess we can all drop 40 bucks and play this game so we can play it for like a month or two and then be pretty pleased with it, right? That Maybe not, that's the area to start in. It's not like a bad idea. The, the truth, though, is that this game also had like a beta. Yeah. And usually for games like this, the beta is the hotness. It's because it's the new thing. Right. Everyone gets in on the beta. But I believe their beta numbers weren't very high either. Like uh, the, the initial reaction wasn't good. And uh, you need that kind of thing to kind of go well in terms of having players talk word of mouth. You get a friend who gets really into it. So then your other friends want to join because that's the group activity, right? And then you, right. You, know, you get the big streamers playing it and doing all the, you know, pushing people that way. And it's just, yeah, it's the... It, and I think it was like you know there's there's the they, they said about like like Redfall, right? Where you know there's a certain point in the development of the game where it's like, I mean especially with this game, like the game was done and is fine. Yep. And they're like, you know, we either, and maybe they did the beta and it did not go well. Yeah. And they're like, either we try to hammer away on this thing for another year put more and more money behind it yeah this already i've heard between 100 and 200 million dollars in this game in redfall yeah no in, in oh in concord in concord wow yeah. all right um i don't know what the exact number is no. but or we just release it do what we do you know and yeah. it does what it does and uh, we move on <laughs> now they uh. might have been hoping to they might have been in uh, hoping that if they had put it out, forty dollars was like enough to get people kind of going, but not like enough to do whatever. They might have swapped to free to play. Fall Fall Guys did that. Right. Fall Guys was originally a thing that you paid for. You know, I think also went to a number of people for like PlayStation Plus or whatever for a mm. bit, but then it turned into like a free to play. And I think if you paid for it, they gave you a bunch of 
currency or something sure. for doing that, or you had to buy the new platform or something like that. But right. like, there are a number of games that start as a, you pay money because we're trying to do that method, and then they go free to play. Right. The um, uh, I saw Page had a comment that went by that said that uh, Foam Stars went free to start. So. That's interesting too. Well, the idea so that that Foam Stars was also really weird because it was also wasn't. I'm pretty sure it was also PlayStation Plus only for a while. Yeah, well, PlayStation's got that weird area where there's and again, maybe they could have done this. Maybe, like maybe could, they did do this buy with, it. with with maybe they did do this with uh, Concord or they should have. But games that are not free to play, but they are free with uh, PlayStation Plus. Mm-hmm. So he's really like, well. But that uh, the idea that uh, this is the free to start idea has been tested in more than just Super Mario Run. Essentially, like it's like this is a thing that other companies apparently have looked at to be like, oh, we. I mean, start with a start with money. Okay, that's not working. We'll try to give people a bit of the game at the start to see if they can actually get on board with it and they like it. And really, we know that what everyone wants is. I want to start the game in a, and I just want a default skin and I just want to get in there and play everything and not be restricted to what I can do and I don't want to pay for anything and I don't want to add any value back to the game and I don't want to do anything for the people who made the thing in the first case and give a good goddamn about you. You owe me your time and your and your and and uh, everything that you've made on this. I owe you no money for that. You should give it to me for free. That is an attitude that everybody cops at one time or another. Ultimately, you know, you always have that thing of like, I would rather get this thing for free than pay for it. Right. I get that. Um, And we haven't like, because we have moved in that direction, it is harder to pull everybody back to the other direction. And there are a few companies that can do that where you can say this game, like if Valve released Half-Life 3 tomorrow and said it's $90, people wouldn't blink. I don't even think there'd be gnashing of teeth about it. If they were, but... And, and I think there's a big difference. And again, you when you go into different genres, there's different expectations. Yeah. If Valve released Half-Life 3 and it was a 6v6 hero shooter. Yes. Uh, I mean, that people will so be... so weird. People will be disappointed. Yeah. And they also will be not expecting to pay $90 for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, Valve has released... Uh, Valve has put out Deadlock, right? And that's kind of this... It's a it's a hero shooter, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and it's not really widely heard of, and it's not really a thing that's breaking a lot of markets, and it's not a thing that. I mean, that's mostly because they've been doing a private beta. Yeah. And they finally opened it up now, and it is getting pretty popular. That's good, and I mean, maybe that's the thing is that also people look at Valve and they're like, well, we know that they're, we like the way they make a game. Right. Perhaps. I think for a lot of people, that's more like. Um here's a thing that people are kind of hearing about, but you can't get into unless one of your friends is playing and they can invite you in. Like a, the the whole join the secret beta has a bit of an allure of its own. Sure, there's that too. Because um, didn't... Oh, it's a little more MOBA, people are saying. All right. You yeah. know, uh, like a lot of, a number of um, social media style things have tried to do that kind of thing, right? It's like, oh, you can only join right now if a friend can give you friend, a code yeah. to yeah. join because we're still doing whatever and we'll open it up eventually. And I know there's the whole idea of that when you're making a free-to-play game. It's like really what you're doing is you're looking for people to fill the role of the chum, right? You need someone to be in there that the the people who are spending a lot of money and a lot of time in the game um, hopefully, if they're spending a lot of time in the game, they're also spending a lot of money on the game, and they're hoping that you come into play so that you're an easy target and you're helping to reinforce how good the game is to other people. I know there's that psychological attitude as well. Well, you know, a, a, a multiplayer game also heavily depends on a place where your friends are. Yeah, right. That's true. Right, like a, a number of people don't. A lot of people. There are a yeah. lot of people who do play multiplayer games and they play with strangers online and they make friends online that way. But a lot of people join places that their yeah, friends are and, hanging out and play yeah, games that and, way. And having the social thing of being able to like give codes to your friends to play and stuff, I think is, I mean, it's a smart way, especially if you're doing like a, you know, you're trying to sort of ramp up in a private beta mm-hmm. and just sort of test your mechanics and stuff. I think that's yeah. an excellent way of doing it. Also way easier to get your friends into a thing if you can send them a thing and be like, hey, come join me on this game that I'm playing. Um, now, actually, slightly related to this story, um, one of the disadvantages of a game like Deadlock being in kind of uh, un- slightly under the radar ness. I mean, talk about like the worst kept secret because everyone knew it was happening. It wasn't that hard to get a, uh, 
a private beta key if you really wanted one, but it was sort of under the radar. Um, one of the problems with that is that the branding is not uh, that clear necessarily because people aren't really talking about it uh, and have because the marketing material isn't out there. Mm -hmm. That's relevant because, uh, unfortunately, I was informed that uh, for this story, because this story mentions Deadlock as a game that's coming out, the, the, that's it's in beta that's, or whatever that's competing with Concord. Yeah, um, I put up the wrong, I, or I, I came up with the wrong graphic. Uh, I put up the graphic, a graphic that is Deadlock with pictures of Deadlock, but the title Deadlock is actually in the wrong. It's the wrong title. There's a band called Deadlock that uh, uses that that has a very specific font, uh, and. I thought that was the logo for the game Deadlock. Can we Turn, show this so, off? So yeah, uh, I want and I want to show you part in. I would like in my defense, <laughs> it's not uh, the the marketing material for the game is not that prevalent. Uh, I would like to show you the Google image search. Wait, I totally didn't test that. Screen capsule. Screen cap is working. Damn it! We'll find out if you, he can even show you. One sec, it's darn it. I better check to see whether this is actually gonna happen. Um, but the problem is that not only uh, is that a, like is Deadlock, um, is the like logo hard to find and this other, this band's logo is much easier to sort out. It looks really good too. Um, I, I and, but apparently, I am not the only person who uh, has made this mistake. Let's see if this works. No. Oh, hey. Hey. So this is the first page of results. Look at this is a Google image search for Deadlock game. This is the first page of results. This is the image I used, which happens to be the title image of a uh, 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 on another article about Deadlock. Mm -hmm. This oh, geez, that was the Jimquisition. Oh, this no. <laughs> is the Deadlock logo. Oh no! Yeah. Uh, it also the font that the band uses is kind of similar to the like Valorant logo font, so I thought it was you know as another sort of yeah multiplayer shooter. I was like okay. So what this says to me because when a because like when the, a, and notice how like this is Valve Deadlock. This is like the shooter behind it. So obviously, yeah. I wasn't the only one who made this mistake. Well, and, and here's the so thing: that makes me feel when, better. When uh, video games, are, uh, especially like something like Valve, would be giving out like uh, press releases to people to say, "Hey, here's here's talk about our game, do whatever," right? One of the things they typically like a game is supposed to get together is a press kit, right? And a press kit should have a logo or mm -hmm. um, like maybe some picture images you can use, something that's easy for the website that's writing about your thing to make a quick graphic. The fact that they're using uh, the logo from a band, probably off of just a quick search to, to find it, says that no one gave them any graphics, probably didn't even send out any proper press releases since and, it was secret beta, whatever. Yeah, and maybe there's, there's maybe a press kit out now there might be now, like they they might they might do that now and that if if it's if the beta you know, is more public. Bees just looked for deadlock logo. Now, when you do that, how would you know which one is correct if you're just trying to put some stuff it's up? It's like because which one's the video game, which one's the band name? Well, and, and, and like oh well, I would know. think that the I would think <laughs> that the first one we see actually is the band name. And uh, I would think, this one clearly is the correct one. Yes, but I mean like like. The first one that you see that's very like you know oh ancient mystery kind of looking deadlock thing right that has the that has you mean the oh that's the first one that kind of looks it's like it says deadcock yeah yeah so anyway next to that <laughs> but you I would see that and be like oh that's clearly not it because the game is supposed to be about like you know it I'm like it's a it's a six v six hero so, shooter so it's Overwatch so it looks like it looked like the third one the band logo is what I would assume right so anyway. Uh... I apologize to the band, you know, the band Deadlock. I I hope that this I I hope that this works out well for them. 
I don't know. This could go either way for them, yeah, I guess. I mean, it goes it goes one of two ways. Either uh, people are looking it up and they find your band, which could be cool. I don't know anything about them, though, so I refuse to yeah. say anything in regards to that. Mm-hmm. Or uh, your SEO is now dead. Yeah, I really hope they don't get screwed over everything. by this. I, I had said uh, earlier that what will happen is that someone people will be walking around middle of downtown valve should somewhere definitely, valve should definitely get them to do a song yes, for the game i agree yeah uh that'll make things even more confusing um but someone will be walking around the uh their downtown course somewhere where all the cool people hang out where all the bands put up their posters and stuff and they'll see a logo on on a like on like a i don't know what these guys do are they metal are they like i think they're metal prog rock whatever they'll see like oh it's a metal festival coming up and they'll see the deadlock logo on there and someone will be like yo what and they'll see it and they'll think there's a band out there calling themselves deadlock german melodic death metal band and their na- and they took their logo they stole their logo from that video game that valve put out a little while ago why would they do that? That's so that's so rude. They should have made their own logo. That's what the fun of or, having a metal band is. Or in a more positive light, they'll think that that band makes video game music. Oh yeah. In cuz a lot of video game music bands typically have like a name that's kind of close to a game or something. Mm. And then they're going to be really surprised. So, anyway, uh so I apologize for that, but there was a reason for it. <laughs> um, let's move on to uh, Genshin Impact. <laughs> uh, so it's this, certainly left an impact, apparently. Yeah. So this is um, this idea of that the the 5.0 update, um, which uh, added some quality of life features in terms of um, the basically there's like some upgrades that have rent that had like random um, attributes to them. So like you spend a bunch of time to grind and get this artifact drop and it might not even be good for your character. So you have to grind more and more and more. So now you can customize them so that it's more workable for your character. And also you can go to this new area um, without having to uh, go through all the previous stuff. So. Yeah, because all the quests yeah. are are appropriate to your level as somebody who's new, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this story was about how there's some people who are complaining that you know they did it, they did it the hard way and now it's easier. And you know there there's a certain amount of like uh, of like I get it. I found it very easy to believe that this was true. And like I get well, it. You yeah. know, and, and not that I would make a video complaining about it. But I, you do get a little, you do get a little grumpy, you know, if you do a bunch of like if you do a thing in a game or you do a thing and then the easier way to do it comes out later comes out and just after you finish doing it. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not saying that that way shouldn't exist that the easier way shouldn't <laughs> exist, but you get a little grumpy on your sure. just being like. But every MMO does this. Yeah, yeah. Like every MMO does this. It's um. It's it's. Uh, so what happened with, with this here is this gets into the meta of how Checkpoint writes its stories. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that uh, there's a Polygon story out there that someone has written that says that, oh, OG Genshin fans are posting videos about how salty they are that all this new stuff exists. And so I see this, like I see the headline for this because uh, Paul puts it into the, the doc for us, right? And I see the headline for this and I'm like, ah, this is more of that same kind of uh, Grognar gatekeeping, where it's like I was here first, and this is my game, and I did it this way, and you should have to do it the same way. And then that just that trolley problem picture mm-hmm. popped into my head, where I'm like, that "This is, a, is literally it." I I hadn't had I hadn't seen that particular version of the trolley <laughs> problem thing. That yeah. I I did very much enjoy that. And it's and the thing is like it's so it's so believable that this is an attitude because I think we've encountered it so many times before that and you, and the thing is, yeah, your, your worst impulses really is when you do see that happen and it happens to you where you're the OG and then yeah. somebody else comes along as your time and you're kind of like, Oh, but I had to suffer. And, and like, and I don't think there's, you anything... take a deep breath and you shrug it off. Generally. Yeah. Like, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a little grumpy about that. Yeah. Criticizing that the new update shouldn't exist. Yeah. Doesn't really make any sense, but being like, uh, and I think that's fine. So, so here's the other thing: is that um, I'm hearing, 
I'm, we're getting feedback that apparently that is only a few people that have actually reacted in this way. Yeah. And if that is the case, that's only a few people and it's like by and large, everyone's actually fine with these aspects, these quality of life improvements, and everything. That's cool. But then that also brings in the question, like how we do it at Checkpoint is we have to find a story generally that somebody else has already written, which means that they have put together um, they've already put together the salient information and they've created an editorial bias and then we have to work our editorial bias on top of that bias. And it's complicated because it means that if we're reporting something to you, because uh, it is, we are reporting something even if we're making fun of it, but it's like when we're reporting something to you, then you end up walking away with the same, the same understanding of the problem that we got from the other thing that was written and I'm like, man, it really sucks. I don't want to stick the blame on someone who wrote the article for giving it a false idea. Because maybe so, also it's, we don't know if it's a false idea. And maybe they don't really know if it's a false idea either. They just see what they're seeing and like, this must be, this must be um, illustrative of what is actually going on in the community. Yes and no. So a lot of websites, this is uh, like, there's a lot of good journalism that is happening, even in regards to video games. A lot of those websites are owned by bigger companies. A lot of those websites also need clicks, which is why we have some kind of clickbaity articles. Yes. Uh, the title of this one is very much about, oh, people are upset about improvements happening. Mm. That's, a, that's a title that kind of makes you want to go click on it to be like, oh, what, what do you mean people are mad at improving the game? Yeah, what's the actual headline? Yeah, I was going to say, here's the, this is one of those great data things. So we got, you know, Genjin Impact players are mad devs improve the game. Okay. Now, the trick always, right, is to look at the URL. Genjin Impact update fan reactions. Oh. Yeah, was, a little cause the u Because the URL slug is usually what the original What the title, reporter wrote. Or, or just what the original title of the story was when it was first Maybe published. Maybe when it first published and then they And then they changed it, it yeah. Okay. Now, so we have that aspect that you, that you have to work with. Also, what we have as an aspect, yes, people feel things. Sometimes a thing happens and you feel mad about it. Even if there's no, logically, it's like, that shouldn't matter. That doesn't, that doesn't change how you feel about a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we were kids, what would we do? We'd go talk to our friends and we'd be like, oh, it's BS that this thing happened. Right. That's garbage. Yeah. We are old. People today are like, ugh. And they post hey, it TikTok, on, and they post this it online. Is garbage. Yeah, there's and then too. people who write articles are like, I need something to write about. Oh, TikTok hates this thing. Blah. And it's like three people on TikTok hate this thing. Or three people on TikTok hate that thing. And some other people are like, Oh, it's funny. Let's make some memes about hating that thing. Yeah. That's there's that too. There's that. Yeah. Maybe that'll get traction because apparently that's the thing we can complain about. Yeah. You so, live your life on the internet and then everybody else gets to comment about the life you're living on the internet. Yeah. So, end result, uh, mm -hmm. I would li like to, you know, um, it's cool, like, in the comments to, to the checkpoint. I like that, you know, uh, when, we, when we talk about stories, often people who have more experience, like, obviously, there's a lot of games that we don't know that much about. Yes. And so we are dependent on other reporting about it. Yeah. And so it's cool to see other people who have, who are, have more experience with the game and might be more familiar with the community, uh, either adding additional context to stories that we've done in Checkpoint or indeed in some cases uh, correcting us. Mm -hmm. uh, so shout outs uh, to um, the, the the Hosk family, I guess. <laughs> some of the Hosk <laughs> folks uh, who uh, who mentioned this took us to task on this and yeah i think i think that you know a fair a very fair criticism it's it's also interesting too because it's like by putting by making that the narrative it masks the problems apparently that the, the complaints that players have that are salient about the new update perhaps. that assumes that there's not perhaps a different article that covers that because is a lot too? of the time there's also several articles about a same game that's popular. Yeah, and this is, but, this is the idea of 
you know, outrage fueling uh, a more interesting story or like a more appealing story for people to consume. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote the thing because I'm like, I can write a very good thing about old people being upset about shit. Yes. With, baselessly. But what what was the complaint <coughs> that was brought forward? Uh, the yeah the the thing that was that uh, was mentioned was that um, apparently this new area that you can now go into, uh, uh, folks have noticed that all of the NPCs in this area, I guess because of the kind of area it's supposed to be, uh, are dark skinned, whereas oh. all of the PCs are light skinned, and so you get. You end up with that, and because of the nature of how RPGs like this work, where there's all the quest givers and all the things, the end result of the sort of, the sort of narrative ends up being light skinned people come into the area, help all the dark skinned people with their problems, oh, good. Um, which is never a good look. Yeah, and to be honest, is although to be honest, is the kind of thing that I feel like. Uh, Polygon would want to write about too. So who yeah. knows? Maybe there's also an article about that. I am. I am. I'm gonna just. The, here's a controversial thing, though, is that I'm pretty sure that that is the kind of thing that MiHoYo and HoYoVerse are probably not aware of. It's a kind of it's a cultural sensitivity thing. That's like that's definitely not a cultural and, sensitivity thing that they might be aware of. And that's part of the sort of discourse about you know, yeah. weather problems. Anyway. Yeah aren't aware of or don't care about I think are two different things yeah I mean it 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 depends upon it, it, this is a larger this is a larger talk about ethnocentrism and maybe that's not what this show is about so I'm just, I'm gonna, just I'm, yeah you're right I don't I don't two, think two I don't think things. any of us know enough about Genshin Impact yeah I yeah. think I'm the only person out of the three of us who's played it and I dropped off two months later so I, from the from when it first started so yeah. i have no idea current discourse in genshin impact when when genshin impact first came out i heard a lot of people talking about it, it looked kind of cool i downloaded it and then i started playing it and after about an hour um <laughs> that i stopped playing it not for any gameplay reasons okay but because the button to the the button mapping was extremely frustrating for me and at least at the early that like first version you couldn't remap the buttons uh -huh. and so like i kept going into the menu by mistake and i'm just like ah i don't like this game. you know what that's fair <laughs> that that's, that's completely fair uh i got i know i got to at least uh, a city so and it wasn't I got, it wasn't like any of the gotcha mechanics yeah. or anything like that they threw me off i got a cool hang glider and it was just like wow i hope we get to I really like to be able to have different hang gliders in breath of the wild and they fixed them tears of the kingdom the um, the the larger point I was making in the story, though, is that uh, people who've tended to be around, I mean, the larger point we all understand of, the older you get, the more set in the ways that you are, and the more that you feel like it's like, no, no, it's always been done this way, and you shouldn't be letting other people get away with having it easier, kind of. Th and it is a very gatekeepy idea. That it's mm. like it should be, it should remain the way that it always has because I had to go through. I mean, the it's same an extension thing. of the like. I, walk yeah. to school uphill both ways in the snow thing and i feel like what that was was saying that it's like only those who have gone through the same thing before me can 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 do the same thing that i am doing and therefore i am building a wall around this to say that you cannot participate unless you pass the strictures that i'm coming up with and i was saying to heather last night i'm like it's funny because when i think about the console war <laughs> back when i was a kid you did not fight in a war so during the console, console war, or not, during the console war, uh, when it was Nintendo v Sega, right? And there's that whole thing about which one are you going to, which one are you picking? Because that's that means whether or not we can be friends. Um, you know, you have to like a thing. It's all tribal, right? It's all tribal. Um, but what I wanted was for, you know, like, it's like how do, how does your tribe win though? It's like well, I wanted, I wanted people to play Nintendo and Nintendo games because if they did, that would mean that more people were playing the system, which means it would actually succeed and survive. And that would mean more games would come to the Nintendo, which would mean more things to play. And I'm like, it's kind of weirdly for the, the, the idea of like, I'm dividing off a group that's like, you if you are, you have to be part of my group, but because I want to make my group larger because I want it to succeed, so I want to welcome in more people to be a part of my group. And I'm like, it's weird how that is also a toxic behavior, but it's also about trying to get as many people into your tribe as possible. Whereas this is a toxic behavior, it's about 
it's about pushing people away from joining your tribe. And I'm like, it's, it's, humans are stupid. Oh, yes. Yes. But like, that's really the bigger like, goal. I, I know that, I, I know a lot of us like make, are like, oh, when older people, they're always grumpy and they're set in their ways. Uh, but I was in grade six encountering this from other grade sixers. So, yeah. I mean, having a group. I don't think it's necessarily an age thing. No. Having a group that everybody is in is no fun because then it's not like a group. It's just everybody. It's just everybody. You say that. Yeah. But I, be just like, oh, when I was in school, I wanted everyone to join my thing. And I'm like, I was a girl and all the boys were the only ones who played the video games because none of the girls seemed interested. They, uh, so, and we were at that age where guys didn't want to play with girls because then adults would call us girlfriend and boyfriend so that's annoying yeah um oh and all the guys that did play video games played playstation and i had a nintendo yeah so i wasn't going to talk to them anyway i guess single player games are where it's at <laughs> exactly <laughs> paul knows uh speaking of well actually no, it's not a single player game but it is a game uh that has been under development for a very long time mm-hmm uh, no Man's Sky yeah. uh, is receiving the aqueous update, uh, which uh, is th- th- they're adding fishing, which, as uh, uh, Kathleen says in, this, in her, her story, uh, that's got to be some kind of like uh, universal, like once a game has fishing, it's that's kind good. of yeah. That's good. You like, feel you've achieved everything. Now, part of now, it. now, everything that you would ever want to do is possible. Yes. It's just, I mean, I. Oh, sorry, I, Aquarius, not Aqueous. I sorry. didn't. I didn't understand that this game didn't have fishing before. <laughs> what I love about <laughs> you this, have water, you're supposed to have fishing in your game. But also, so it feels appropriate that it should have fishing. Right? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, the um, here's by the way, I love. Uh, it's a good piece of art. Here's yeah. the art that uh, apparently uh, uh, inspired them to uh, put fishing into the game. Because um, you're the same, you know, you, the idea of like building, um, building a, uh, you, you, because they've got all the base building and stuff. And so the idea of sort of building your, uh, building your base beside like a nice, uh, a nice lake or an ocean. Right. So you have a nice view and everything was already a big, was already a thing. Uh, but now you can do something with it. What I love about No Man's Sky and the the kinds the kind of uh, developers that Hello Games is, mm-hmm. is so they're like, okay, we're going to add fishing. What does that mean within our game? So they're like, okay, you know. We're adding fishing to the game. It's true. There's different types of fishing. And of course, because of the whole, the way um, No Man's Sky is thing, there's, you know, normal fish. And then there's also, you know, there's all sorts of fancy, weird, alien, fishy type things. Right. All procedurally generated and everything, of course. Right. (laughs) But then they're like, you know what? If we've got fish, clearly we need to make you know new kinds of ships or new, new kinds of things that you can build so you can like go fishing out in the middle of the ocean yep makes sense to me rather than on the shore uh clearly we need to have uh collectibles like messages in a bottle that mm-hmm. then can have like whole quest lines attached to them mm-hmm I mean, uh, that seems like a nice extra. I wouldn't say they had to. I saw bait was in there. And yeah. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Different baits. Automated fishing traps. So you can like put down fishing traps and then go away and come back and collect all your fish mm-hmm. up. That, that's mm-hmm. good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, that they can have, um, you know, there's a whole aqueous, uh, Aquarius expedition. New fish cooking recipes. Pickling fish, marine steak, oh, mollusks, flesh, you could cook in grilled game. filet, fish fries. Uh, records, of course. So... Yeah. Now you have to. Yeah, now there's all how different things. How many you've caught? How big how, they how are? you caught? And of course, uh, No Man's Sky. There's a big thing with like naming all the different oh, things. Oh yeah. If you're the first person to find a certain type of creature, you get to be like the uh, one to name yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, deep sea diving suits. <laughs> so you can do okay, deep water cool. exploration. This is just way beyond fishing at this point. Yeah. Yeah. New posters, the special equipment, the lost angler's rig. A little figurine for your ship. Oh, cute. Uh, Aquarius flight pack. 
anyway, what I'm saying is uh, they do it upright. They sure they, do. They're, they're like, you know what? If we're going to do fishing, like, let's do fishing. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's wow. get this all in. It's a, it's a weird... So, on Earth, if you were trying to catch one of every fish on Earth, you'd be busy. Like you would probably not ever be able to complete one that. of every type of fish. One of not well, like yeah, one of every type of species of fish that's out that, there. That yeah, that would take you a long time. Yes, that would you know decades, decades and decades of time. And so if it's at like all possible. Yeah. So if you have, you know, you have all these worlds where they're probably going to generate. I'll be generous. Maybe a world might have twenty different types of fish on it, as opposed to where we have three hundred types of fish that are mm-hmm. like nameable fish that are on our planet, or you know, mm-hmm. even more than that, right? Like. Um, but this, I, I, I just love the idea that, um, I mean, just like everything else in No Man's Sky, there are effectively unlimited fish yeah, right? that you could go to another planet and you could just find another 10 or 20, uh, types of fish and just keep popping plants and stuff. I just, when you said the, um, they did, they did it up right. And we were talking about the appropriateness of fishing for No Man's Sky. And it made me think of. Uh, Legend of Zelda that has had multiple times in different iterations has had mm-hmm. different fishing mini games as part of it, and they've never like they're fun, but they don't do anything to the gameplay other than give you a reward. Right, you right. catch the Hylian loach and you get a piece of heart, and then you go on your yeah. way. You don't. I have mean, to come it's back usually a heart else. quest thing. Yeah, to a degree. Yeah, and and like so the idea of of a game of like No Man's Sky saying like we're we're tacking on a fishing mini game we're tacking and they didn't they were tacking on fishing as a means of now, production and crafting the, and and all of course sorts the of difference stuff. with No Man's Sky though is that there isn't any like a heart piece or whatever yeah is sort of the only way Zelda can like interact with you and sort of give you an incentive yeah. Whereas No Man's Sky, I mean, in a lot of ways, No Man's Sky, like, doesn't, like, there's no reason to there's go no, fishing at there's all. There's a quest in, in the idea. Other right? than you want to go fishing, right? It's, yeah. it's an entirely different kind of, like, there's, you're just kind of doing your thing. Yeah. And there's fishing because why not? And it's the idea of fishing is leisure, then it's like built into your video game that already is built around leisure to be like, we've also now built in a new leisure component to your, to your leisure component. Now, what about golf? Does No Man's Sky have a golf capability? See, I think wow. almost every video game should have fishing in it. I don't care if every video game has golf in it. I mean, no. but the natural but idea. But a golfing of... video game should have fishing in it. But yes. you have, but you have, because No Man's Sky is a lot of like, uh, you know, ground, mani- like terrain manipulation. So golf could be kind of cool. I don't know that we need to destroy fictional worlds in the way we do our own. To make it go, you just make it like an entire, just just an entire planet covered in like very short grass. And it's just like a green, the entire planet is a putting green. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom both have golf. Do they? In the canyon. They have like one little. Yes, they do. Mini game area. They have an area where you can play a single round of golf. Like a single, or not a whole round, a single hole of golf. There's golf and there's there's like a snowball bowling. Yeah, I think so, yeah. As well, and um, there was the snowboarding was in one of them. Yeah, because you're, you're shield surfing. Yeah, shield surfing. Yeah, they do that in a couple different right. spots. But the idea, I mean, even like uh, Skyward Sword, I think, had shield surfing. Um, but the, the idea that you have a, um, uh, that, that like, yeah, golf now, I think, is maybe the next thing they have to add. Now that you've brought it up, is like that's the next thing in No Man's Sky. There's something very, that primal thing of I pick up a stick because there's just a stick on the ground and I just hit a rock with it. Whether you hit it like a baseball or yeah. you hit it like cricket or you hit it like whatever, the idea of like I pick up I a mean, thing and I hit it. I'm going to I'm gonna say there's a 100% chance that there is like people have made like emergent golf-like things in no like yeah. anytime you have any kind of physics engine yeah people are gonna make a thing where you hit another thing into a yeah <laughs> they're gonna turn it into some sort of sticky ball hitting thing yeah a stick ball game of some sort yeah but anyway uh and uh the last story yeah in the uh uh in the checkpoint uh was a uh, beige talking about the uh nintendo museum which is this is because like we talked about this last week yes 
because this, you know, this news came out a little while ago. Um, but this was sort of a chance to get your thoughts in a more well, kind of. I mean, Checkpoint was off for a couple of weeks. So yeah. Chillpoint talked about it. Checkpoint, Ch- really Chillpoint and I, talked and about I it. wasn't here for the one that we did. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, this like get your thoughts in them in a I know you, uh, you in a checkpoint. Were, you were here the week that uh, that news broke because you watched it. You said oh, yeah. you had thoughts you wanted to put together for it that you would maybe do it in a future checkpoint, and then you did do that. Yeah, and so yeah. congrats on Thank and you. Uh, on, on yeah following through. Very interesting talking, talking about. And again, you know, we talked about the uh, hearing, seeing people talking in the comments. Um, some really interesting, you know, people uh, either with background in museum curation and stuff talking about that they uh, they agreed and or or uh appreciated your talking about it and the idea of like different these sort of different types of museums and like what should a museum do yeah the idea of a children's museum is uh is popular in a lot of places and i that was never something i grew up with and i think I don't know if it because it's like children's museums have been around for a long, long time. They just haven't been everywhere. And yeah, I, I mean, didn't, you know, grow up in a rural area, but I grew up in a small that's, city. So. That's that's true of a lot of things, right? It's like some places have uh, just uh, interactive things, like uh, you know, the theme parks where kids can go get jobs. Yes, right. Right. That's we, not like an everywhere thing, but it was kind of an everywhere thing for a while. Yeah, and. Then you have uh, different museums depending on where you grow up. Where I grew up, it was very like uh, homesteads and stuff was a big part of their thing. So they actually, their museum was a place you walked outside and they had reconstruction structures where you could look inside uh, what a room was supposed to look like from that time period, things like that. Right, yeah. Because, yeah, of course. Not really interactive, but like not just like a, a thing hanging on a wall. But of course, yeah, the, the, the idea that like museum covers a very wide range of you know place paintings on the wall to sort of you know historic uh uh you know whatever the uh you know the gold rush town where you have yeah the, barkerville, barkerville uh, fort edmonton park is a good example or, of that or this you know the science centers where you have all the interactive you know the yeah the idea yeah. like the museum can encompass quite a large well, and you thing. looked up the, you went to see, what is the there, International Association of Museums? Yeah, something something like that had a definition, and it was something like... Uh, it's not for profit. Not for profit, uh, publicly accessible um, structure, a uh, place that's meant to be permanent, and... Devoted uh, to education, education and entertainment. Entertainment, knowledge, and like... A variety of experiences. A variety of experiences, yeah. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> the, I ask you to explain it, but like as you're saying it, I'm like, wait, I'm remembering it all. So yeah, sorry. Good. But but that's like, um, and then that comes back around to, well, then the Nintendo Museum uh, eats up most of the definitions there. Maybe the not-for-profit part, we can definitely argue on that. Probably obviously. not. I mean, I, I'm willing to say that there's probably a number of museums that don't follow under not-for-profit, but... Yeah. I mean, corporate and, museums are also like a well... That's a very common thing. You yeah, know, yeah. You'll, you go to whatever the you go to the place the place where you know yeah. coca-cola was invented they've got the coca-cola museum sure. yeah i just I, I i need everyone to know that while beach and i were having conversations about this piece i pulled out my phone googled the definition of museum and then said well the definition of museum is yeah. blank yeah i got to be that person mm-hmm. in person there's nice. there, there's a very um the one thing I did mention, and I'm like, I saw somebody talk about, well, you know, but because they're like, I'd like to think, but then again, corporate propaganda was two words that they mentioned, right? And I was like, I want to address that idea because I think that's interesting. I don't think there's anything, you know, and, wrong with coming at it from that angle, and, too. And I mean, you, you talked about the idea that obviously we are seeing... It is a corporate exercise. We're seeing the version of, of Nintendo that Nintendo wants to put forward. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think you covered uh, that in the story. It's their yearbook picture. Yeah. Yes, and boy, is that that is the best way to look at it. It's like, how do you want to be portrayed for the rest of your life to the rest of the world? And it's like them saying, "Here we are. This is who. This is who we are. This is how we see ourselves right now." Because if they had done this back before the 1980s, 
it would be a very different animal, right? It'd be all the board games, it'd be all the other stuff they make, all the toys that they've kind of expanded into, right? They might not mention the Nintendo taxi service they owned or the Love Hotels that you reminded yeah, me of. Yeah, so because I was uh, when I was talking to Beach about this, I was like, technically, for a period of time, Nintendo decided to uh, diversify their portfolio by having a taxi service and Love Hotels and these things, and. And that's seen as a smart business decision to do. And then they got rid of those things because they were like, we really want to just focus on more of an entertainment side of things. Yeah. And I like to imagine that like Miyamoto was really involved in the, the Love Hotel. Uh, yeah, he was very the, interested. No, in it like, would have been before. It's, uh, it's all it about play. Been, uh, <laughs> oh, shoot. Which president was that? The one before Yamuchi? Iwata, I think. Yeah, Yamuchi. Does not surprise me. Yamauchi really strikes me as the kind of guy that'd be like, "Yeah, we should buy a taxi service. Let's just have a taxi service." There was a time where Nintendo, their name was not Nintendo; it was Madafuku, um, which I find very funny because I swear I've seen Madafuku on billboards in Nintendo games. I think I come. This is a complete guess on my part. Sure, I would. I would hazard that at the moment, Nintendo has possession of more cars than they did when they had a taxi service <laughs> there are more like official nintendo cars that's a very interesting <laughs> idea that never occurred to me but yeah it's, the, the, given the size of it yeah um the but the corporate exercise part i think is important because the coca-cola museum is an example of this as well the idea that like it's it's a um there's nothing wrong if you know that what you're going to go see and experience is a corporate exercise that they're like, well, it's just, this is part PR, it's it's part um, indulgence for the company, and it is definitely a thing of we want to show you these things because they are important to our history, and we understand and mm-hmm. we understand our history, um, and it is not a third party uh, done at a remove uh, experience, which would have I think more scholarship. And would be a much more. That's why we have third-party written books about Nintendo, and why we have all these right. other yeah. things. Um, and it's like I think there'd it'd be way more interesting to have that presented. Uh, but Heather did say it's like you wouldn't get the same kind of um, presentation. I think you wouldn't get no, the same it's... kind of thing to be like I made an I Beach made a Nintendo museum, and he put everything in it. And it's like yeah, that would feel weird. Well, because. As people, even even curators, I'm sure we have our own biases, right? Yeah. So, like you're talking about oh, all these third party books that have been written about Nintendo, those are still people with biases. There's one out there that talks about, I think it's it's called Console Wars or something, but it is written more favorably, I think, towards Sega, and that's again, that's a person's bias. That's not to say it's mm-hmm. not a good book or anything like that, but like we have biases. Yeah. If you made a museum just Nintendo, yeah your biases would show in that too. Absolutely would, yeah. And and like obviously when it's being made by Nintendo themselves, they have full access to everything. Yeah. In terms of in terms of, you know, all the old, you know, whatever they want to show, they can show they don't need permission, they don't need to do anything. Um and also oh. the if you're just, you know, if just some random people are making a museum, ain't nobody paying for the ginormous Wiimotes or whatever. Yeah, there's <laughs> like, that too, right? There's I mean, also, that's where the funding is coming they're, from. They're probably right? not doing that, but like um, one thing we probably won't see necessarily in the Nintendo Museum is other things we associate with Nintendo but aren't actually Nintendo, Yeah, right? Like other games that came out for the NES that or the Super Nintendo that are heavily seen as Nintendo but are third party. Yeah. Right, like, probably. I don't think there's a Kirby section in there, or a GoldenEye yeah. section is probably right. not going to be Right, or like uh, Final Fantasy was heavily Nintendo for a long time before right. Right. they Good point. they swapped to PlayStation. We're probably not going to see some cool uh, wax museum yeah. section with every like por- uh, portraits of people or whatever. Or maybe we will. Maybe there is a section that'll be the lines will be less short, or will be more short. Because yeah. it, they're not the like mm. hang out like in a, a room and and hit things off the wall. And well, I, it's it's like like a, a section that's just like a wax museum of like realistically proportioned Mario characters. Oh, I was thinking <laughs> yeah. of like it's you like, know whoa, it's like oh here's bad. here's uh, here's Miyamoto and he's holding up the Wii. 
I yeah, mean, I can see them. There's Reggie like, having yelling that, about yeah. how he's ready. Like, we're probably no. we're probably not going to have like a series. There's probably not going to be a, sh- a little winger presentation that kind of like here are notable names for Nintendo's history and having like a little you know a thing to be like this is Hiroshi Amuchi and he was the longtime president when Nintendo got into uh, the video game market in the first place and here's Gunpei Yokoi and yeah I and mean here's, we might not see and that. here's Satoru Iwata and it's like you, I would love for them to have something up about Iwata there but I I mean you know. I would hope so but like. We might not see that in the museum. I was I was telling you the other thing I was saying was uh, you go you go look at the Mona Lisa. You don't necessarily learn everything there is to learn about the Mona Lisa at the museum, right? You yeah. read more about it in right. books and you do. That. That's true. However, the museum specifically has a gift shop. Yeah. So maybe there's some cool coffee table books. That would be yeah. They might all be Japanese. I mean, hopefully not, mm-hmm. but. I mean, the other th- on the other side of that, the flip side of that too, is that you can look at the Mona Lisa reproduced in like, you know, massive posters or in, in coffee table books or whatever. You can look at it like that. But the, the idea of seeing the art face to face holds a lot of appeal to people that you cannot reproduce in just that form. Mm-hmm. And so there's that different thing of sometimes you got to go to the Louvre to see Mona Lisa to really understand what the Mona Lisa is even if you don't get the story that goes with it. Have they talked about, I'm curious, like a lot of the marketing around it and stuff and looking at their webpage and things, a lot of it is like, you know, showing all the cool stuff to do there yes. and all the cool things and and uh, different stuff. Has they Have they talked about like specific uh, artifacts? No. That they have? Nothing. You know, like this is Miyamoto's first sketchbook or something. And that's what I mm. wanted, but they don't talk about not that, that at I've all. Not that I've seen. And, and not even a thing that's been like, we have a wing that shows off a lot of these things or like a, or a, here's a shot of like original, like, cause we've seen the, um, we, for a recent one that I did about Popeye, we did that Nintendo story about Popeye cause they did the Popeye arcade game and there was like a... Um, there's like Miyamoto sketches to show how he would lay that right. out. Oh, and how yeah, would, that was a few and, weeks, while ago. Yeah, and then it was like, and then, and then it was also his sketches about how he'd lay out Donkey Kong and stuff. And it's like, these are the things where it's like, that stuff should be up so people can see this is how they used to make video games. This is how, when they were designing stuff, how they'd think about that. There should be an area for them to go over. Like Koji Kondo has made so much music for Nintendo games. So they starting off to be like, how... Let's talk a little about who Koji Kondo is, and let's. I mean, he's still alive, I think, and it'd be a little weird to be memorialized in a museum like that. But to be like, let's talk about how that had an influence on all of the Mario music that came after that. How like jazz fusion, and spe- specifically like, Japanese jazz fusion, became kind of the signature sound of the Mario series. I know it's not exactly what you want, but they did have a. Ver- they did show a thing in the video of a variety of TVs that when you stand in a specific spot, you can hear the music from that specific game. Yeah, the directional speakers. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. cool. Um, yeah. So I, I imagine they do want to have some stuff in regards to music. I mean, yeah. now just actually talking now, what I re- what it will be really cool mm-hmm. uh, is, you know, um, I, I think, it, I don't know if it's still running, but you know the like Experience Music Project? Yeah, in, in Seattle. In Seattle. At the Space Needle, right? Uh, so. Yeah, 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 it's on the grounds there. Um, I'm, I think it's still running, but maybe it was a casualty of the pandemic or something. Oh, anyway, yeah. mm. um, anyway, one of the cool exhibits that they had there was um, they had uh, these uh, consoles with, um, they had uh, Sweet Dreams by Eurythmics. Okay. Um, they had all the stems. Oh, nice. Of the thing. So, you, and, and you could go through and like, turn on and off all the different tracks and they they chose that song because it specifically has you know really strong uh bass line and really strong it's things. called the museum of pop culture now okay apparently oh, mopop. mopop i like anyway, mopop. mopop but but the you know you so you could like you know you could play with it and like turn the volume up and down and change the different aspects of it and it was just sort of a uh, an Learn. illustrative process this is how mixing works yeah, yeah. um but th- the idea of like that something like that but illustrating the uh limitations and thing and and the techniques for like putting music onto like a nintendo Mm -hmm. you know you only have four uh voices yeah that can be playing at any one time Mm -hmm. you've got like what a couple instrument a couple of sort of sounds that you can make yeah 
and trying to you know, create how this is how they created sounds and you know this is how you can see in this track that you know the different you can uh, personally like we use a lot of uh uh commodore 64 music yeah you know for for loading rerun stuff and we've got a commodore 64 music emulator program that we use sometimes uh and the commodore 64 has very specific you know audio emulation things and it's amazing to see people how people used it in such creative ways and that the the way that you would have written music for the nes back in the day is not that you would just play it into a computer and it would remember it like on a keyboard is that it had to be programmed like it had to be right there wasn't had, the sort of synth keyboard yeah, midi thing you couldn't there wasn't a tracker that was kind of like or there was a very rudimentary style of thing that was like a tracker where you know you but, but yeah very different anyway um, yeah. that kind of thing will yeah. be cool i think so is what yeah. i was just yeah. thinking but and, anyway and once they open up in like i think it's october which it, reminder for anyone who's like oh man i want to go there day one uh i believe it's lottery for a first couple of months yeah for... and i mean it's going to be busy so you might want to wait and you need a, a little f- bit you need a nintendo account to actually register to get a ticket oh interesting yeah i mean those are free yep for various definitions they put um, your they put your nintendo your little me on the ticket oh right <laughs> yeah <Thank you. laughs> um but like once they open up, we're gonna see a lot of people who want to go there and to, to do writing about it. So if if they allow photography and video, which I hope they do allow some, yeah, hopefully we'll get to see like kind of the other things they hadn't really talked about. So, yeah, that's true. There's you know, probably some stuff that there haven't been, you know. Like yeah, there's super probably promoting. some stuff they didn't really mention because you know it's a video. It's still like a ten minute long video talking about this museum, and if they go over absolutely everything, why would you go? Yeah. Uh, anyway, we, uh, let's, so uh, the, the, coming up. the coming up here, uh, we were talking about, uh, the, <laughs> the Minecraft movie teaser trailer that just came out, which, uh, has not been received very positively. Really? I want to watch the movie now. Now. I, cause I, I, that, that was the first time I'd seen it. And I was like, I kind of want to see that. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't want to go to theaters to watch it. I want to wait till it hits some sort of streaming sure. thing that I don't have to like yeah. pay extra for. No, I, I think it might be a fun time to watch with some friends and to laugh at. There is this one of those. This is there's yeah. There's a certain uh, aspect of like, yeah, it's a kids movie, so you know it's not directed at uh, Minecraft playing adults. So you know the hot takes from us are probably not going are not like thing. the main thing that i could criticize about it yeah uh other than the like that like thing that they've done a few times in different mediums but like minecraft graphics with uh realistic texture with realistic textures is kind of weird yeah a little i'm not i'm not i'm not a fan mm-hmm. um the big thing for me is Jack Black. That's actually why I want to go see in the, it. In, and, you know, I love Jack Black as an actor, but just him in the movie where, and it's like, I don't know whether, uh, like, not shaving was, like, part of his contract or something, that he just, like, looks exactly how he looked when he was just doing voiceover stuff for the Mario, Mario movie. movie. Yeah. I don't think you can uh, tell Jack Black what to do anymore, the, though. The entirety of his costume appeared to be they put him in a blue T-shirt. Yep. <laughs> yep. It to me it looked like he was acting, in he was doing like the blue T-shirt and doing this stuff, as if he was doing performance capture, uh. that would then be replaced, <laughs> and they just didn't replace it. <laughs> now and and to be honest, Steve has a shirt that is that color and frankly like you why would you put him like jack it wouldn't make any sense to have him walking around in like a three-piece suit like you know or, no. or like you know like crazy robes or anything like that it's like yeah it's just i did like the thing where people were like okay but how are the creepers going to be represented and the zombies like are those like are, are the zombies going to have just green are they just green jack blacks <laughs> oh because they're supposed to look like him yeah right i mean creepers they showed in the trailer are just like big oh they're just they're, big. they're, they're, okay. they're just what they cute are. guys yeah. wandering around so anyway Anyway, yeah. it could be fun. It might be fun. I, a lot of people criticized the Mario movie, and I'll agree. It's not like 
an amazing experience of a thing, but it was still kind was of fun. a fun, decent yeah. thing. The weirdest thing about the Mario movie was the two eighties pieces of music that played. Yeah, and but, I think you know, and I think yeah, I think the the Minecraft movie could be very fun. It probably can't be any worse than Borderlands. Well, I mean, that's the other thing that the other tape that I've seen is yeah, it's probably going to be that right. Pe- people uh, they're like, did somebody bribe them to try to take? you know, take the heat off of Borderlands <laughs> by making an even worse movie. That is, I, 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 and it's like, I don't think it's going to turn out to be pixels. Mm. Right. Oh, I mean, there's yeah. a thing we all had to think about for yeah. a second. In, in terms of, like, in terms of bad movies? Yeah, in terms of bad movies and reception and whatnot, mm. I think that, I, I think that, yeah, it does come down to, because we're all saying, well, it's for kids. And it's funny how, how readily we're able to just accept the idea that it's like, oh, it's a Minecraft movie. It's not rated R. Why would it be? But it's, like, it's a Minecraft movie, so it must be for kids. And even though there's lots of Minecraft playing well, adults, because a lot no, of Minecraft playing adults to, used to be Minecraft. To, to be kids. clear, I'm yeah. not saying, I'm not saying it's for kids because it's a Minecraft movie. Right. I'm saying everything in the teaser trailer indicates that it's, it's for, for kids. kids. That's what I mean too. Yeah. yeah. But it's <laughs> but it, that idea of like, well, it'll definitely attract kids who play Minecraft. It's like right, and it won't attract uh, Minecraft playing adults who used to be Minecraft playing kids because they grew up and got older it's like the lego movie right it's like the lego movie didn't really attract lego playing adults or adults who used to play with lego as kids on this on this okay. thing of it's the lego movie the lego it was movie more about was when good. you heard about how good the lego movie was you're like oh right oh i should go see it even though i don't give a crap about playing with lego at this age because i i don't but i still wanted to go see it after i heard what it was about yeah some of the things that uh have happened on nine o'clock i think might qualify a movie as a Minecraft movie as being R-rated. Yeah. Some of the some of the horrific situations those guys have gotten their little Minecraft people into. <laughs> we'll uh we'll, we'll I'm sure definitely uh Cameron will end up going to go see the Minecraft movie. And you can't make that promise. We can't make that promise, but I'm sure he'll just go see it. <laughs> he did it once that and that means that that's permanent. <laughs> no. now. Exactly. I'm going to I'm more waiting no. just when we get to send him to get him to go review this, these skibbity this, toilet movies, so. No. Yeah. yeah. Stop I'll trying be to say things that you don't understand. I've seen, to. I've seen, uh, I've seen pixels. I was not like I would put it at about the level of other sort of very mediocre Adam Sandler movies. Okay, yeah. I wouldn't. It isn't a travesty. It's just fine. Yeah, right. that's probably true. I never went and saw it, so it's not. I, saw, I mean, I didn't. I, I had to I think about it what on, it was. You know, Netflix but, or whatever. Oh but. sure, but you know, there's. There's something fun sometimes about it being really late at night and you're really tired and you just want to watch something that you're like, exactly. it might be okay. <laughs> it could turn out to be garbage and I'm okay with that right now. I'm in yeah. that state of mind. Because it's not really about me watching anything good right now. I definitely have some pretty, uh, some a lot of like half-watched movies on my Netflix thing. But... I mean, you should definitely nope out of a movie if it's like not going anywhere, uh, but you know. All right, let's let's talk. A co- There's a couple of stories um, that actually I found this morning okay. that I wanted to bring up. Uh, I don't think these will necessarily be uh, go to, but one of the things is um, we talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, this is positive stuff that um, there was uh, the SAG AFTRA was um, there they a couple of week a couple of weeks ago back in July they op- they they authorized the strike for. Um, voice voice actors. Okay. Um, and well, not just voice actors for, um, video game performers. So voice actors, motion capture people. We got more news on that. Uh, yeah. So, um, there, the strike is still ongoing. Okay. But, uh, got good news about this. Yeah. Okay. Good. 80, uh, 80 game uh, publishers have signed, um, an intermediate con, a, a, uh, uh, like a memorandum of understanding. Uh, yeah, what do you call it? Uh, a interim contract. That's yeah. it. Not oh, intermediate. Okay. An interim contract. Um, basically, it's all the things that they want. So <laughs> it's funny. Like in the context of the sort of uh, strike, you know, union versus management. Yeah. This is basically management breaking ranks right like this is the people you know when you have when you have you know one team versus the other team or whatever this is a bunch of the people on the on the game developer on the game publisher side are like 
stepping across the line. Yeah, there's, yeah. they're being like, yeah, we'll, we'll. Oh. And so the cool thing about this is that means that they can maintain a, what is effectively a strike against the public publishers that aren't signing this thing while they're still working because yeah. they're working with publishers. This is, I mean, when the, when there was the, the actual, the actor's strike, um, there was a couple of uh, movie production companies that did this. Yeah, A24, I think. Yeah, was like, yeah we'll was sign like, whatever. Just get back to work. Uh, yeah. And so, which is a great situation because, you know, you sort of, it makes it so you have, uh, the, the it takes away a lot of the leverage of the publishers because they, uh, they can't just sort of sit there and outlast you in the same way. Exactly. So, yay. That, that is the point so, of unions in this case is to is for is for because labor's like we don't have the money and we don't have the influence and a lot of other. Like, uh, I'm sorry. Can I get a recap because I didn't really follow what was um, just said. Yeah. So okay. The the um, the majority of the uh, current problem is or, or the, the 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 dispute between is around uh, generative AI stuff and yeah. the idea of using the performance for other purposes and stuff. Mm. So now... Uh, so Seg after had a complaint that they were like, we don't want you to sign into contracts that you can use these things to, to generate voices. You like we, we want you to have things in the contract that forbid that. Sure. I know why they're striking. And I, then, what I don't understand is we, we said stuff about publishers breaking rank with each other, being on different teams, and I didn't really follow. So the, this idea, football the, the, the idea is a bunch of the a bunch of the publishers uh, have um, signed interim agreements with the SAG-AFTRA. Um, oh, okay. So that so, they can get their work done. So but they they're not so they're basically they've said yeah. we, we accept the without the sort of larger um, negotiating body of the publishers arriving at a conclusion these guys have just gone like you know what we're happy to work with you guys we'll do whatever you say oh okay we'll sign your okay. contract let's do it that sounds great um so it's a win for the for the right. so they're still uh, on strike after. that's still kind of so they're still on strike happening but but they're only on strike who... against the people who won't do what they want so okay it works nicely yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the nice thing, and one, well, and and so my my point of like that's the nice thing about general labor, like labor in general, and, and unions working together on this, and, and like because when you have one big union that can say to a bunch of people who are publishing is be like you might have the money and you might have the influence in terms of lobbying and negotiation with laws and like all those kind of things, um, but we have the labor, like we have the people you need to get that part of the job done. Yeah. So you can either. Stand up against this, and you can hue and cry about what oh, it's a terrible thing or whatever like that, and not get anywhere because we have the people you need to make the work happen. Or you can decide that it's actually worth working with people who need you to protect their jobs. You know, like we can come to an agreement that actually works for both sides, which is you keep employing these people and they do the work for you. Uh, and it's and like against railways, I guess that would have been the same thing. Like a general railway strike would have been like, oh, this railway signed an agreement with the with the railway workers union. So, so now, therefore we go back to work for them. So all you guys are screwed. So now one railway mm -hmm. is going while the other ones aren't. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's a, it's a great it's a great thing because then it's going to pressure the others to. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know what's even better uh, to continue the uh, good news, <gasps> good, good collective bargaining news going along. Uh, it's a good day for spiders. Yay! <laughs> oh, right. The, the uh, dev team? Yeah, we talked, they to, were dev we team, talked right? last week about uh, the company Spiders, uh, which just uh, results in excellent headlines. Yeah, it does, because yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's, oh, yeah, you weren't used. It's, it's, it's a company. It's, so Spiders, who is the developer. They put out a statement. They're, devel they're the developer of Greedfall 2. Um, they, uh, there was a big, they're, they're a French developer, uh, and there was a big, um, thing that happened, uh, last, uh, last week right. where the video game workers union, uh, released a, uh, a statement signed by some like half of the, um, workers for the spiders. For spiders yeah. Okay. Um, Saying about how you know the uh, really bad conditions, uh, overworking. Oh, and that they weren't like showing up to their like negotiations. Uh, and that that, that, kind of that thing. you know their their complaints were being ignored. All this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, spiders then came back, being like, uh, "This is a complete fabrication. 
our employees are very happy. It's uh, and we strive to to do things and and it's defamatory. Yeah, it was, that you're saying all these bad things about us. Right. And it's like, dudes, this is not like, you know, the an expose news piece about it. This is a letter signed by your employees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't say oh my God. Um, all of our employees are happy and this is a lie when half of your employees at least are telling you otherwise. Yeah. Also oh, part God. of that complaint was that they don't listen, so have them like coming back with a thing that was basically clearly them not listening some more. Is yeah. even better. Anyway, mm. uh the good news is um uh the company so despite uh, despite maintaining uh, that they um, uh, that that they uh, are not um, that that the the statements about poor working conditions were are not true, they have uh, announced that they are raising the minimum salary of the company by eleven percent starting September 2024, but retroactive to April 2024. Oh, good. Love a retroactive raise. Um, they have also, uh, uh, they also are going to benefit from a new telework company agreement project that will enable remote working, uh, improve its remote working policies. Uh, Spiders Management wrote that the company will establish rules around remote work that are in line with practices already in place at Spiders, but without operating their, altering their key principles. Uh, the company will also conduct an audit on working conditions and the company environment. Um, the management at Spiders emphasizes, this is a, a message from, this is a, another missive from the Spiders. The, mes the management of Spiders emphasizes that the working conditions prevailing within the studio do not correspond with the portrayal made by them, some made made by some in the media in an attempt to destabilize the company. Ah. The management relies on everyone's sense of responsibility to ensure quality dialogue and it values. So basically, they're like, everything is, you shouldn't have said all that. Everything is fine. We're going to, Fix the things that you were complaining about. That you lied about. <laughs> we're, we're fix the things that you that you were complaining about, mm -hmm. but we are in no way admitting that those were actually problems to begin with. Yep. Which is holy shit. Not. It's slightly unsatisfying, but in the big picture, the things actually got done. So I call that a win. Yeah, I would <laughs> say so too. It's still a win. It's yeah. uh, it's not a good relationship. But yes, um, like, and apparently due to weirdness or due to odd things in, or, or differences in how French libel laws work, uh -huh. there is actually like theoretically a possibility that there could be a real lawsuit for libel, which doesn't make any sense to me. But Because yeah, we've always, we've always kind of come at it as that if the statement is true, then it's not libel, it's news. Right. Right. It's like you can't. Turn but around and there, there have been precedents of other studios like their Quantic Dream. Yeah, Quantic Dream. They, they, there's the mention that that Quantic Dream uh, won their lawsuit against Le Mans, It sounds like yeah, for for exposing uh, poor working conditions. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but on the whole, positive. Okay. All right. Uh, speaking of times when companies did really stupid things. Oh no. Um, remember back a while ago when Unity changed their terms of service? So yeah. that they were like, we're going to start charging everybody yeah. here. We're going to do a whole thing. Charge where per download. Charge per download and change yeah. our whole licensing system. Yeah, all kinds system. of things people had questions about that they and didn't we, know how to answer. We, like, talked about, we talked about that for like two months. <laughs> yeah, that was like, wasn't that previous Moon Maze? It was, it was causing people to migrate off of Unity and like look up Godot and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, it was huge. Which is the interesting part of this story. Oh, yeah. So you this, didn't buy Godot or something. Are we still waiting for coffee from him? Sorry. This, this is a story. So this is an interview with the, uh, the main, some of the main, um, now Godot is an uh, open source thing, but some of the main uh, contributors or, or uh, I guess, sort of, Direct, d maintainers? Uh, maintainers of the Godot project. Okay. Um, talking about how um, they 
you know, everyone's like, oh, it must have been pretty good for you guys, the thing. And they're like, we actually were, we were really hoping that Unity was going to keep it together for longer than they did. Like, we knew, <laughs> basically, Unity got got bought by uh, whatever, whoever they got bought by. Yes, and it was uh, awful. In, like, 2019, and they were like, you know, this is going to be bad. Yeah. The Godot, like, and... Godot came up about that time. And But they were like... Okay. Here's the deal. Godot is an open source uh, uh, thing. It's very cool. It's not as polished as the Unity engine. Yeah. Sure. Fundamentally, it, they don't have the kind of resources. Yeah. And so they're like, what we are, are the worst thing that could have happened is everybody dumps Unity, comes over to Godot, and then uh, can't, you know, everything collapses because there's all these people who are making demands on mm -hmm. the development process for Godot being like, why don't you have this feature? Why don't you have this feature? Yeah. Why don't you have this feature? This this project sucks. We got to go somewhere else. And they go back to Unity and they'll take whatever. whatever they get. Yeah. Um, and so what they're saying is that, thankfully, mm -hmm. uh, like a couple of months before that Unity change happened, they had just pushed, it, pushed out like the 4.0 update to Godot, which they were like, it was finally sort of in a pretty good spot. Yeah. It was still missing, you know, it still wasn't necessarily feature parity with Unity, but they had, you know, it was doing pretty good. Uh, and and so, and, and they were, they're saying, you know, they, they were very positive about, you know, how uh, they were very uh, surprised, but very happy that, you know, Unity developers coming in were uh, open to, you know, learning to the new, you know, the Godot way of doing things. Right. Mm -hmm. And also uh, current Godot developers were very uh, uh, happy to give some guidance as to how to, uh, how to update, how, how, to, how to move into the different things and stuff. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, some features didn't work. For, you know, there's some people it didn't work for, some people it did, but... Uh, it's this idea of, you know, especially when you're talking about like open source projects, having a ton of people with a certain amount, certain expectations rush onto your thing is not necessarily like a positive. No. No. What you really want not. is like, a, you know, a steady stream of people. You don't want necessarily yeah. this huge chunk all at once. And briefly, I was like, oh, but if you're attracting a ton of developers, like people who have computer science experience, and they're coming over to your open source project to be like, okay, I want to move my game inside your engine. Then you would think that'd be nothing but a good thing ultimately because you'd be like, well, maybe there'll be people who'll be willing to muck in and help. And I'm like, right, but the problem is the people who make the games for it's, Unity don't, aren't designing game engines. Yeah, it's a different yeah. skill set. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's, I'm sure there's crossover and I'm sure you do get an influx of, of development expertise yeah. as people well. People who know but. how to write good bug reports and people who want to talk about certain aspects of the thing. They're like, I don't know how to implement this, but I know that it can be done in X, Y way. And then it's like, but that's all they can do because they're like, I can't, I don't have the time or I don't have the ability to, uh, like the, the chops to really dig down and fix that problem myself. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the whole reason why you're using an engine rather yeah. than trying to write your own or start from scratch, right? Like you you're trying to save yourself work. Yeah. Exactly. You're you're yeah. Oh, I really wanted to you reminded me of something that's going on in the Linux kernel mailing list right now where um people who are trying to work on stuff that uses Rust, the language Rust, mm. that they are having a harder time uh, trying to integrate the things they're working on into the Linux kernel because when they try to write a certain piece of software, like a certain driver or whatever it is, they were like, oh, we can't use this because when we try to write it in Rust and we try to make it work, the, the, all the memory leaking and shit that C kind of puts up with and you can deal with, Rust doesn't want to deal with. And so they're like, we literally cannot write whatever it is you're doing in C. Can you give us some more information about how this thing works in C and they've been told it's like, no, we're, we can't. We can't just write the way that it works in C. It's like, but we literally can't do it in Rust because Rust doesn't work that way. It's too memory safe. Mm. It's And it's been very, it's been tragic in a lot of ways because it's leading to a lot of people at loggerheads and the guy who was working on the Rust for Linux project resigning. He was mm. working on it for four years and he's like, you know what? I'm just going to not, I don't want to be involved anymore. And he just 
he's he's resigned, which is fair. You're allowed to do that, right? But well, yeah. Sometimes you need to just walk away. Yeah. Anything else, Paul? Um, it, the uh, there's one more, st- or or maybe maybe we'll do one after this. But the main other story I want to talk about, which may cause some uh, conversations as well. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this story was actually uh, was sent to me um, by uh, Luke. Um, you know, I was saying, please, you know, forward me any stories that you think might be interesting and might not have picked up the thing. Um, this is a story about uh, a game called um, Melvor Idol, which is um, made by um, uh, the, uh, the people who do RuneScape. Oh, okay. Um, Jag. Off. No. Uh, what are they called? <laughs> I keep trying to. I, I keep thinking Jagger Silk, but that's the really? that, that's, 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 that's a tea. local tea shop. Um, Jagex, that's it. Um, anyway, uh, they are currently oh, running idle as in as in yeah Melvor idling a idle. car, not as in singing. Yeah. It's an idle game. Kina. Yeah. Um, now they're so they're they're doing this um, mod contest. Uh, we are excited to finally announce our creative mod contest for 2024. Oh no! Um, we sponsored, sponsored. We we partnered with mod.io for this contest. Um, you know, there's any mods that add one new skills, new items, new monsters, combat, pets, game modes, whatever. Uh-huh. Um, doing all this stuff, and they have you know prizes. First place, thousand dollars. Second place, seven hundred fifty dollars. Three thousand dollars for the prizes in total. Okay. Um, so. This opens up this very interesting question that I always have, that I'm personally kind of interested in and uh, can be relevant to what we're talking about here, to, to, to stuff that we do too, is this like, you know, because of course the, the, the uh, there's been a lot, even just in the comments to this uh, Steam, to this news post that they uh-huh. did, yeah. and also in other places online, the disc, the, 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 uh, back and forth of like I love making mods and now I can you know get some money I could win a thing I could get yeah this is awesome versus so these people are getting us to make a bunch of content for the game for free yeah that's where I was going to go potentially because you might not win an award well it depends on what the rules state too like a lot of a lot of contest rules would be like anything you submit becomes property of the company yeah um and technically, if you winning prize money and we decide to use your thing, but you've submitted it and we own it, uh, we don't have to pay you anything. Uh, there's there's a variety of stuff. so, and, and this is an area like and and as with a lot of these uh, things, I feel like that, you know this is kind of a gray area in that certain you can do it in some ways and people would be like that's great, and then things get tweaked slightly and it starts to kind of get a bad feel to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's quite, and I find this is also very interesting that this is one of the few areas where like saying, Hey everybody, you can make mods for our game. Right. Nobody says anything. Yeah. But offering money, like doing, getting people to do it for free is all fine. But as soon as you sort of make money a potential thing, it changes the calculus yes. yeah. a little bit in a weird way, right? And not even necessarily in like a in more in a, like a psychological way than in an actual uh, fundamental way of the thing. Because it would be interesting if they were more like, hey, everybody, you can make mods. And they're like, Hey everybody, we're going to now that people have been making mods, not a lot of people have been making mods, but some people have been making mods for the game, and that they're like, we're gonna hold our first annual uh, you know, Malvor Idol uh, mod awards. And we're gonna have three prizes, like for a second, third, or whatever, and we're gonna do it, and maybe you can you offer less money at that point, but it's like and it's like you guys get to vote on what you think the best mods are, and we're gonna we're gonna provide uh, we're gonna send the money for that. Completely different way of coming at the problem. And then people might be like, yo, what? And it's like, yeah, we're going to do this every year. We're going to do this every three months or something because we want to encourage people to, to feel like if they you know, write a good enough mod that the, com- that the community likes, if you, if you put it like that, that you dropped it as a thing that people didn't know you were going to do, that probably would be much more interesting to people. Mm. 
But anyway, so I, to be honest, I've gone all back and forth on this myself. Like yeah. this is a this is an interesting question. Uh, I've certainly participated in things without you know without wanting or or expecting compensation uh just because well, i think it's a fun thing to do sure yeah mm-hmm. uh and i think in those cases like you know for instance the i, don't, I was just trying to think like the longest johns did like a community sing thing and they got people to record themselves doing it yeah it was super fun i really enjoyed doing it if they had been like if you record yourself we'll give you 15 dollars to do this I think that would have not made me not want to do it, you know? <laughs> like, I think that would have, like, because then that sort of changes it. It's like, yeah. eh, that seems kind of yeah, shady I feel, I feel like when it comes to, like, um, so if a game says, hey, we have mod support and we're, you know, uh, blessings to mods, come do things. If you feel up to it, we're, we're cool with that. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be mostly in the PC realm because console modding is different and weird. And... You know, you you want that mod community at that point, but you're not going to put stipulations on it. When you say things like, hey, we're going to do prizes for mods, so we want people to make mods, it kind of feels more like there's someone in a back alley with candy trying to lure in children. (laughs) Yeah. And it it puts a different feeling towards it at that point. That is a very different feeling all of a sudden. Now, what what Beach suggested where it's just like, oh, yeah, uh, maybe once a year we we give out an award to uh, the mods that we think were the best or whatever. Also a different feeling. Yeah. Right? And and I don't know. It's... But like this team feels like an art contest where it's like, oh, everybody, somebody will win, but we'll keep all your shit. You know, it's like... Yeah, and that's kind of the problem because I've seen cosplay drama that kind of runs around stuff like this where people are like oh we'll do a design contest and uh if you if you win i'll let you have one of the things that i intend to sell from your design but i'm not going to pay you yeah. right it kind of it feels like that and that has been a thing i've seen in cosplay i'll content. make your thing and send it really, to you and also make 30 and really sell people. like yeah <laughs> i i think the there there is a slight additional layer because this is like an idle game yeah that's fair Idle, sorry, I D L E, yeah. not idol. <laughs> idol. Uh, so you know the content and the sort of like adding little things to it is basically the entirety of the game. Oh yeah, with with an idol game. That's like, fair, yeah. Like the sort of little little uh, uh, graphical elements, graphical elements and stuff is sort of that's basically the whole game, right? right. That's what you're doing anyway. Right. Hmm. Um. Anyway. I just thought that was an interesting topic, um, and it's something that comes up, you know, relatively frequently, in as you say, in lots of different areas. But in the video game realm, in particular, I remember there was like the thing, and that was like I feel like it was probably like two different editions ago for the idea of the that when they announced like Beyond Good and Evil two, mm. when they announced it like for the sixth time, what it was like we're gonna have a whole world. That's going to be populated by stuff that you make. And everyone yeah. was like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is funny because, like, uh, if you think of uh, uh, Splatoon, at least when they had, like, the message board system and whatnot, people were doing artwork and stuff that was right. technically around in that game. But it's not the same, right? It's not. Yeah. It's just. It's just not the same. Yeah. Uh, so suspicious of them. Uh, yeah. And speaking of suspicious, uh-huh. mm-hmm. What's so thank suspicious? you for that segue. Yeah, mm-hmm. I thought you might want them. Uh, you and I are a team. We're going to vote him yeah. in. What, what, uh, yeah, what would be the ideal person to have on your side if you were, for instance, let's just say randomly, on a spaceship where you have to do a whole bunch of menial tasks and one or two of the people on the spaceship could be an alien that's killing other people. Who would you want to have on your side as the best person to detect and uh, accuse other people? <laughs> We're really narrowing the scope here. Yeah. Is it Ripley? Ellen Ripley from the Alien series? Hey! Or is it Miles Edgeworth? <laughs> I... 
I am trying to fathom how this happens. So, <laughs> like, uh, Ace and Turdy Investigations came out today. Yes! The, 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 the two-pack of Game right. 1 and 2. That we're finally getting to. But also... Uh, and um, Among Us is doing a crossover. And I don't get how they work that out. Because Capcom does not seem like the kind of... I mean, Capcom... Capcom versus SNK, Marvel versus Capcom. They love to do collabs with like even yeah. games and stuff. But it's just weird that that Inner Sloth, that's who it is, I think. Like they talk to each other and like, yes, we can we'll make a Miles Jesworth costume, why not? It's it was I don't get it. Like I get if it. You, it's so good. <laughs> it's just me or I'm for some reason on the when it's on the among Us guy, the front of, I just was realizing the front of Miles Edgeworth's hair is exactly the same as Aerith's hair from Final yeah. Fantasy VII. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. that, is some, that is some anime trope right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, something about the, the uh, Among Us guy with the hair on top of his suit uh, and the like cravat, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just find amazing. Uh, Captain Spam asks, is there a social deduction game where it's possible that nobody is trying to sabotage everything, but the way it's set up, everyone believes there could be someone who's still working against the team? I'm sure there's probably some sort of like variation I, of werewolf. Where nobody's I, guilty, but everyone's trying to accuse somebody else. Yeah. Cause I think it's the purpose of the game. Yeah. I, yeah. What was the... There's oh. a there's a series called The Getaway. I think it's The Getaway, which is like a road trip for six people and one of them's the mole who keeps trying to sabotage what's going on. The trouble is is that they've all been given the card that says you're the mole and <laughs> And so they're so, all trying to sabotage the, the entire trip. There was that, wasn't that just Road Quest? <laughs> there, there was that um, there was that improv thing uh, SCT tried to do that one time at an event where he, he did a murder mystery. Yeah, and the person who was supposed to be the murderer never got told that they were actually the murderer. Right, so because they we needed to play it convincingly that we didn't that none nobody killed anybody. But you, but. but he, yeah. he gotten told, but he hadn't heard that the proper information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> at the end of the thing, nobody knew who the actual murderer was. Yeah, they talked and... to all of us. They went around and, like, I was in character and stuff, and they were talking to me, and I was giving all sorts of information and stuff. I didn't remember who the murderer was supposed to be at this point, but it was just like, I was just well, trying none, to none say of you, and... None of you were supposed to know except for the person who was actually the murderer, guilty right? Guilty because yeah. they, was... were, they were supposed to do a reveal, and the host was just standing there being like, you're the one who, and everyone was like, "What? No!" <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah, I like, I mean, I like doing them reasons, like a murder but... mystery party, and at the end, it's like, "Hmm, maybe it was just an accident." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the idea uh, of like, I did kill them. I forgot. Oh shit! Sorry, everybody. I feel so bad for her that she had to put up with that. <laughs> she ran a really good show. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's uh, that's all the news that I had. Thing. long episode today but i thought i i enjoyed talking about you know we we talk about the news and stuff but chill point is kind of a fun instance where we get to talk about the sort of so slightly sort of meta aspect of some of the stuff about the episode of checkpoint you know that that mm-hmm. uh, we wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about so uh, reacting yeah. to the comments and uh, i'm i'm just glad that this week we Got to talk about some positive stories for once because that feels like it's been a while. Yeah, uh, I don't think we we had a layoff story. No, no, uh, both, both. Our saddest story was Concord, <laughs> which you know will probably get sadder later for other reasons or something. But but overall, this was like both hey, of the like employee action things. stories yeah. were like positive ones. It's just nice. Uh, I'd like one more week of this, please. Anyway, uh, so. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of Chill Point. And we will see all y'all later. Hit up the Patreon and the store. Right. All of that good stuff yeah. that I always forget Remember, about. the Patreon is what keeps lights in our eyes. I will catch you every time if that's what it takes. <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs>